Glad to have you all here with us today. Those of you watching online, we're so glad you could join us uh, as we're beginning a brand new series today. In fact, you picked a great Sunday to be here if it's your first Sunday because we're starting this new series called Right in the Eye, and I'll get to more of that here in just a couple minutes. Now, we're going to begin in a bit of an unusual way today, and I'm going to tell you a story from... Uh, well, it's one of the most bizarre stories of maybe all of ancient literature. It's perhaps the most bizarre story of specifically Jewish literature and the Old Testament, what the Jewish people would call the Jewish scriptures or their scriptures. And so I want to give you a heads up that this is not a G-rated story. Um, so if you have young ones, just be aware of that. You may have some interesting conversations. Uh, Kid Connection is still open if you want to go move them in there. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that, and I'm giving you fair warning about that. So um, this story takes place in the history of uh, the nation of Israel. It takes place in the book of Judges, if you're familiar with the book of Judges. In fact, one of my favorite um, stories comes from the book of Judges. It's about a left-handed man named Ehud. I'm left-handed, so I like the story a lot. We're not going to talk about that story in this series, but I would encourage you to go look it up. Whether you've heard of Judges before or read Judges before, you know it takes place in a very fascinating time of Israel's history. This isn't mythology. This isn't um, allegory. This is history. And let me tell you a little bit about the history that leads us to the point of Judges. In case you don't know, the nation started with a man named Abraham who was chosen by God. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had two sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons. We studied one of those sons last summer. Anybody, bonus points for anybody who knows who that son was. Anybody know? Joseph, you guys rocked. Greensburg failed. They only got one of the, only one person said it, but good job. Yeah, it was Joseph. And so Joseph led the nation or the, the family. It was just kind of a family at that point in time to the land of Egypt. And when they were in Egypt, they grew into a nation of people and they lived there for 400 years. And then God raised up a man named Moses and Moses led the people to the promised land for 40 years. They wandered in the desert and toward the end of that 40-year time period, uh, there was another man raised up. His name was Joshua. Joshua came about in around 1380 B.C. And then, years and years later, there was a very famous king in Israel. You've probably heard of him as the second king. His name was David. He came about in 1050, roughly 1050 B.C. And so there's this period of time, about 330 years, between those two events. And that's when this story takes place. Now, here's what's interesting, because during this time period, the nation of Israel was kind of a commonwealth of these 12 tribes, and the 12 tribes were named after the 12 sons of Jacob. And these 12 tribes had kind of one thing in common, and that was God. Their God was in common, and then the men had a surgery because of their God. And uh, they, they all kind of operated under this law. There was no king, but God had established a law through Moses. And so because of that, um, there was no king in the land. God was their king. They didn't need a king. They just needed to obey God. But here's what's interesting about the people of Israel during the period of the judges. They were a lot like you and me. Do you know how? They didn't like being told what to do. <laughs> right? I mean, you didn't think you could relate to anything in the Bible, but I just gave you something, you know. They, they were people just like you and me. They did not like being told what to do. And so because of that, they didn't like God telling what, them what to do. And there was this ongoing cycle that the people of Israel dealt with. It went like this. They would disobey God's law because they didn't like it. And then as a result, it would end in disaster, and they would find themselves pressed against a wall. They'd find themselves enslaved. They'd find themselves frustrated and not knowing what to do. And so as a result, they would cry out to God, and he would deliver them. And then they'd, you know, kind of wipe their brows and say, Whew, we're not going to do that again. That was a mess. I mean, that was such a big mess. We're not ever going to do that again. God, we promise. We'll always, God, we promise we'll never. And they didn't. And for, that lasted for about a week or a month or a year. And then they went back to the very thing that they were doing before. Now, here's what's interesting, and this is kind of why we're looking at this and why we're going to look at the whole kind of nation of, of Israel and the book of Judges throughout this series, is that we can kind of relate to that, can't we? I mean, that's kind of a picture of our lives, that there's some kind of law that we don't like, whether it's a law at your house, a law at your school, a law on the highway, you know, a law in our country, whether it's a religious law or just a law of conscience. And in your mind, you know, you know what you're being told to do, but you don't really want to do it. And, and your conscience saying, don't do it, don't do it. You know, you need to follow the law, follow the law, but then you just kind of ignore that. And as a result, 
it takes you to a place you didn't ever want to go. And you realize that you're at this place, you got kicked off the team, or maybe you got kicked out of the house, or the police, cops got called, or you got taken down to the station. I mean, you know, whatever it was. And then in that moment, you had to call someone to bail you out. You needed some deliverance. And so you called your mom or your dad or your coach or Sunday school teacher, whoever it was, you reached out, you prayed. I mean, and somebody, you know, they threw you a bone, they helped you out, they brought you back, and you said, oh, I am never going to do that again. And that commitment lasted for a whole week until you went back and did the same thing. I mean, we can all relate to it. That's all of our stories. And that's really the story of the nation of Israel. And what we're going to discover as we look at this particular story in the history of the nation of Israel, uh, this is what happens when you take that to an extreme. This is what happens when you take that, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and you can't tell me what to do, and what's right for you may be right for you, but I'm not saying it's right for me, and I'm just going to do whatever I want, and you can't tell me what to do, and you can't tell me how to parent, and you can't tell me how to vote, and if I should wear a mask or whatever else, and I'm just going to live however I want to live. And you can't stop me. This is the natural result of what takes place. And so we're going to actually fast forward to the end of the book of Judges. And it's kind of fascinating because for 330 years, I mean, there's just kind of this, this pattern of disobedience, disaster, deliverance, disobedience, disaster, deliverance, disobedience, disaster, deliverance. And there's this downward spiral down, 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 down to this cesspool that is ultimately kind of just rock bottom. And the Israelites need to come to their senses of where their decisions have taken them, where their attitude of I'm going to do whatever I want to do and you can't tell me ultimately lands them. Now, it's possible you're in here today and you can relate a little bit to that. And it's possible that you can think of a time when you hit rock bottom and you paused and you asked yourself the question, how did I get here? I mean, how? What, what decisions did I make? How, how did I get here? And this story, I think, will bring some resolution to that or at least some answers to that, I guess. Um, it's a fascinating story. So just so you know, again, at this time period, there are these 12 tribes. It's kind of this commonwealth of 12 tribes, and each tribe is made up of tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And the account begins with a Levite from Ephraim. A Levite was from the tribe of Levi. That's one of the 12 tribes. And he got himself a girlfriend. In fact, it was called a concubine back then. And a concubine was kind of like a wife, but not really a wife, maybe a little bit like a servant wife. Um, this wasn't a custom that the Israelites were told to do by God. This was a custom that they acquired from the Canaanite people who lived in the land that they were moving into. And so because of that, um, you know, they didn't kick the Canaanites out the way they were supposed to, and they paid dearly for it. And this was one of the ways, and we'll get to that story in a couple of weeks. Um, but so because they didn't kick him out, they brought in their customs. And so he has this concubine-ish wife. She's from Bethlehem, the same Bethlehem we're going to talk about in a month and a half when Christmas comes. Except this is no Christmas story, I promise you. I mean, she, they're, they're together, and uh, she's either unfaithful to him, or it's possible he was harsh with her or abusive with her. And so over time, she decided to leave. And so she headed south, back to Bethlehem, back to her father's house. And about four months passed by, and this Levite decides that uh, he wants his concubine back. He's lonely, or he's angry, or frustrated or remorseful, we don't really know, but he decides he's going to go down south and gather back. So he takes two donkeys and a servant, heads down there, gets to his concubine father-in-law's house. I don't know exactly what that relation looks like, but they arrive there, or he arrives there, and the concubine's father is happy to see him. He welcomes him, and then he offers something that was very important in this time period. It's hospitality. When somebody, when a foreigner, when a guest was coming, you welcomed them into your home and you provided, you know, food and drink for them. And so for three days, it's kind of like merriment. It's like eat, drink, enjoy, you know, have this nice time together. And uh, they do that. And he gets up on the fourth day and says, okay, this has been nice, but now I want to take my concubine and I want to go back home. And so the father says, no, 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 no. You just woke up, you know, you're hungry, you know, let's just, why don't you stay for lunch? So he stays for lunch. And then after lunch, he gets packs up, ready to go, and the father-in-law says, no, 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 you know, it's too late in the day. You can't go now. You just need to stay another night. <laughs> so he stays, he eats, drinks, probably gets a little bit drunk, wakes up, maybe even with a hangover, wakes up the next morning and, you know, 
wants to leave. The father-in-law says, no, you can't leave yet. I mean, just stay for lunch again. You know, that'd be good. So they stay for lunch, get to the end of lunch, and he says, okay, I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm taking my woman, and I'm going. And so they load everything up. They head toward Jerusalem, which at this point in time didn't belong to the Israelites, and they realize it's getting late in the day. So the man's servant says, hey, you know, we've got to find a place to stay, and Jerusalem is not a good place because there are foreigners there. Why don't we find a town that uh, belongs to the nation of Israel that's part of this commonwealth of people? And so they end up going to Gibeah of Benjamin. It's populated by the Benjamite people from the tribe of Benjamin. Surely there are household. They'll welcome us in. There's no Motel 6, right, with the light left on for them. There aren't cities at this point in time, the big cities like we're accustomed to. So they arrive at the town square, and the way the custom worked was that you sit at the town square and you wait for somebody to come and welcome you into your home, their home. And so they sat and waited, and people came and went, but nobody welcomed them into their home. And time went on, and people came and went, and nobody welcomed them. So it got to be kind of late at night. And so finally, there was a man who stopped, and as it turned out, it's kind of interesting, the man was from Ephraim, but he's living now in Gibeah. And they realize, hey, they've got a lot in common, right? It's kind of like when you run into somebody from your hometown or your home state, and you're like, hey, you ever eat at this place, or you know these people, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, that's great. So, So he takes them home, and they have dinner, drink a little bit, probably share some stories, and that's where things get really, really weird. Um, Are you tracking with me on this whole thing? Because, you know, it's been strange up to this point, but now it's going to go downhill in a significant way. So as they're eating, as they're drinking, as they're sharing stories, the house gets surrounded by men. Uh, The scripture describes them as wicked men. And here's what happens. It says, pounding on the door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so we can, and I'll let you read the rest for yourself. Talk about awkward, talk about bizarre. Now, this was Canaanite behavior in this custom. It was not for gratification. Frankly, it was for humiliation. It was to send a message that you don't come to our community as a guest, and you can just pass that on to everybody you know. Do, tell them, do not come to Gibeah, because this is what will happen to them. Now, again, this was a custom of the Canaanites. It became a custom of the Greeks, the Romans. Frankly, it's a custom of prison culture here in the United States. I mean, you know, this is just a bizarre custom. And so the man who's providing hospitality, the laws of hospitality, he was supposed to defend his guests. So he went outside. The owner of the house, the text says, went outside and said to them, no, my friends, don't be so vile. Don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. Now, keep in mind, these are God's people. I mean, this is the nation of Israel. These are his chosen people. And look, look where this has devolved. He goes on, he says, look here, look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I'll bring them out to you and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. And can you imagine? Can you imagine how terrible this was? text continues, but the men would not listen to him. So the man, that's the Levite, he took his concubine, the one that he had to go fetch, the one that he was going home with, and he sent her outside to them, and they, and you can read the rest on your own because I don't want to put it up on the screen. Suffice it to say, it was a night of living hell. As she was used and abused and delivered back to the house, and she collapsed on the doorstep. So the Levite got up the next morning, you know, stretched, gathered his stuff, got his servant, his donkeys, he opened the door, he sees his concubine lying on the doorstep, and he says, hey, get up, it's time to leave. She didn't respond. So he picked her up, he threw her on a donkey, he realized that she was dead, took her back home, and he was angry. He was so angry that he decided to respond the best way he knew how, which was to cut the woman up into 12 pieces and to send these grisly packages with a little bow on top to the 12 tribes of Israel with messengers who would undoubtedly tell people who were the recipients, this is not an Amazon Prime delivery, you know, it's no Christmas gift in here. So you open it up and find a body part. 
the grisly story of what had happened and what had taken place. And a few days passed, and the world was absolutely shocked. The text says this, everyone who saw it, who've got these packages, was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Translation, we have hit rock bottom. Oh no. I mean, how have we gotten to this place? Just imagine, we must do something. We can't allow this to continue, so speak up. This lawlessness, it has to end. So they decided that they would assemble an army and they would go to Gibeah and there they would demand justice. So a message was sent out, an assembly was gathered, then all Israel, the text says, from from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came together as one and assembled before the Lord in Mizpah. Everyone except for the tribe of Benjamin was represented, and there was also a community, Jabesh Gilead, who apparently didn't send any representatives. But the rest of the people, they were enraged and they wanted revenge. And they were going to avenge this poor girl and the treatment that she had received. So they went to Benjamin. They said, you know, we want you to send out your people. They wouldn't send out the people. Instead, they raised an army of 26,000 men and 700 young men that they were going to just go at it in a civil war unlike anything they had seen before. The rest of Israel raised up 400,000 fighters. Day one, 22,000 Israelites I mean, these are their relatives. These are their cousins. They were killed. Day two, 18,000 more Israelites were killed. 40,000. Think about the casualties. That is 40,000 lives were lost, 10% of their army. And so they went before God crying and saying, God, what do we do? I mean, you you know, they had prayed about going into battle against the Benjamites and God told them, yes, go. And so what do we do? God said, go back, I'll hand them over to you. And so they went back, and this time as they approached the city, the Benjamites came out to attack them, and they retreated and pulled back, making the Benjamites think that, you know, they were going to win. And so the Benjamites abandoned their city. Meanwhile, another army went into the city and utterly demolished it. The men, the women, the children, the animals, I mean, they burned it to the ground. So the Benjamites turned around, they saw their city burning, and they realized that they were done. 600 of them fled into the wilderness, and the rest were slaughtered on the spot. But the bloodlust was just growing. And so the Israelites, they decided, you know what, we're just going to go throughout the rest of the land of Benjamin, and we're going to teach them a lesson. And so they went into every community, they destroyed every city, all the men, all the women, all the children, all the livestock, decimated And they woke up the next day and said to themselves, oh my goodness, we've gone too far. We destroyed an entire tribe of people. We destroyed our people. All that's left are these 600 who are in the wilderness. What do we do? So they thought about it and they decided, well, okay, these 600 men, their wives have been killed, but if we can repopulate the tribe of Benjamin with these 600 men, we should do that. But we've all made this oath because they took an oath when they assembled together that they wouldn't allow their daughters to be married to any man who's from this terrible tribe of Benjamin. So what are they going to do? Well, somebody realized that nobody had been representative of the city Jabesh Gilead. So they sent 12,000 people into the city to destroy the city. They killed the men the women, the children, everybody except for the female virgins. And there were 400 of them. Now you can just imagine how this goes. Honey, we're sorry we killed your parents and your siblings and your dog, but you know we're, we're going to use you to lure out these men of Benjamin and provide a wife for them. That'll, that'll go well for you, right? So these 600 men were lured out. They realized there were 200 who still didn't have wives. So you know what they did? They said, well, there's going, to be a tri- uh, there's going to be a celebration in Shiloh, and there'll be women dancing, and so here's what we'll do. Why don't you guys hide in the vineyards, and when the celebration takes place, you just jump out of the vineyards, and you go grab yourself a wife and sling her over your shoulder, and you just carry her back to the land of Benjamin. And if the parents are upset, if the dads are angry about it, we'll just say, well, you didn't break an oath because, you know, you didn't give permission for this. They were stolen from you, and then it'll be Okay. And so that's what happened. And then the book of Judges ends. 
I mean, there's no hero. There's no resolution. I mean, it ends, if it's music, it ends on a minor key. I mean, it's just this disgusting mess, a pitiful disaster. Bet you never heard that story before, huh? It's not one that you tell at bedtime. Hey, kids, you know, let, let's, let's pull the flannel graph out and you can move the parts of the body of the concubine around. I mean, that just doesn't work that way. There's no Bob and Larry and the diced onion veggie tales version of this. I mean, this is, this is a Halloween story. It's like, save this one for Halloween. This is like the purge. And yet it's the history and it's the story. And it ends with this haunting verse. The text says, in those days, there was no king. There was no king. There was no authority. There was no one upholding the law. There was no moral compass. There was no one saying, this is right and this is wrong. There was no submission to each other or even to God. And so the result of this is that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone said, I don't care what you think or what you have to say. I don't care what you believe morality is or morality is. And I'm going to do what I think is right. And I don't care what you think. In fact, another way of saying that is in those days, there was no binding moral consensus. There was no agreed upon right and wrong. So everyone followed his or her own moral compass. And truthfully, when you go back in the story, if you reread it for yourself, which I mean, have at it. It's a fascinating piece of literature. When you go back and reread the story, what you discover is that every step along the way, each person did whatever he thought was the right thing to do, regardless of what, you know, morality said or regardless of what God's law said. And the end result was absolute, utter, total chaos. I mean, the men of Gibeah, they say, we don't want a foreigner here. How dare these foreigners come here? So we're just, bring them outside. We'll have our way with them. It doesn't matter what the law says. It doesn't matter what's, what's natural. You know, we're just going to do this. Or, or then you've got the Levite who says, well, I wouldn't be in this mess if she hadn't run away. And sorry, honey, but, you know, you know, throw her outside. And you men, you do whatever you want with her. I mean, think about that. Or then, you know, the murdered concubine, and he's angry. And he says, well, this isn't right. And so I'm going to chop her body up and send it out to all the tribes to send a distinct message. I mean, I think the message got communicated, didn't it? And that's what we're going to do. And then all of Israel says, well, those Benjamites, they need to pay for this because this isn't right and they've taken us to a place we never wanted to be and so because of that you know we're going to go just decimate all their people and oops we went too far but we need to find wives for these 600 so let's go ahead and kill the people from Jabesh Gilead because we don't know if they'll give their virgins over or not so we're not even going to give them a shot we'll just go ahead and destroy all of them and take their women and those poor women who are dancing at Shiloh and they get accosted I mean Everyone, every step of the way, it was a train wreck. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes every step of the way. And do you know what I think is the most troubling about all of this? Is that there's some of this in us. There's some of this in you, and quite honestly, there is some of this in me that we don't want to be told what to do. It's my life. I'll do whatever I want. You can't tell me how to parent. You can't tell me how to handle my finances. You can't tell me if I should date him or if I shouldn't move in or whatever. I mean, blah, blah, blah. You can't tell me what's right for me is right for me, whether or not it's right for you. And who are you? I mean, that's kind of the American dream, isn't it? It's the American dream. We want the freedom to do what we want, when we want, with whom we want, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Nobody's going to tell me what to do because it's my life and I'm going to live it however I want. And you're not going to tell me what's moral or immoral. You're not going to tell me any of those things. This is my life. It's not yours. But because we're civilized Americans, we add a very civilized caveat to it. You know what it is? As long as it, what? Doesn't hurt anyone. Yeah, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Oh, good. You know, that makes it okay. As long as nobody's getting hurt. I'll tell you what, that's what this whole series is about, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks. But before we kind of move on to that, I just want to pause here and, and unpack this concept a little bit. Because quite honestly, I mean, everywhere we turn in our culture, 
whether it's advertisers who are, you know, they're just trying to get us to buy their stuff, or whether it's musicians and their music, or the movies, or the movies we watch, or the, the television shows. I mean, they're all kind of tugging at our heartstrings. They're all kind of pulling us in the direction of liberation, and nobody controls us, and we do whatever it is that we want to do, and you can't tell me what it is. But I'm telling you, my friends, that is a flawed concept. It is a flawed concept for a number of reasons. The first one is only the super rich can afford it. Because eventually, you're going to end up at a place where you need a lawyer, and only the super rich can afford lawyers. I mean, truthfully, I mean, they're out living the high life and acting like their lives are some utopian dream, but the truth is they're not. They're not. They're on spouse four, five, six. Their kids are in and out of rehab. I mean, they're filing for bankruptcy. They're, they make it look so great, but I'm telling you, it is a farce. But you talk to people on the consequence side of the equation, you talk to DCS workers, DCS workers who, you know, are meeting with parents and say, you want to get your kids back, you know the best way to do it is do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want, and yeah, you'll get your kids back. Said no DCS worker ever. Or teachers, right? At the end of the day on Friday, they say to their kids, hey kids, you know, you go home and you have a great weekend and your parents think they know everything, but they're so stupid. You just do whatever you want, drink all the Mountain Dew you want, stay up as late as you want, and I look forward to seeing you back on Monday. Said no teacher ever, right? I mean, we know that. The people who live on the consequence side and who deal with the consequences of this sort of behavior realize that it's only the super rich who can get away with it. And even then, at some point in time, they don't get away with it. You can't do what's right in your own eyes without eventually hurting someone. I mean, in this story, one of the things that sticks out to me so clearly is it's the women. The women were hurt so much. I mean, men and children were hurt along the way as well, but the women were used and abused and as possessions. And I'm telling you, in a world where, where we just do whatever we want with whomever we want, whenever we want, that's what happens. You know who else gets hurt? You get hurt. Eventually, you hurt you. And you're someone. And you matter. Maybe you need to hear that today that you're someone and you're, you matter. And ultimately, you live this way and you'll be mastered by something. And what's so interesting is that what began as like personal freedom and liberation ultimately ends up becoming a master. And we become enslaved by an addiction. We become enslaved by debt. We become enslaved by unexpected children. We become enslaved by habits that we can't break and we want to stop, but we can't. And in the midst of us expressing our freedom, we are ironically building a prison of control around ourselves and we cannot get out. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But the truth is you cannot live this way and not hurt you. But you know who else you hurt? Because none of us is an island unto ourselves. You hurt the people with you. You teenagers in the room, your parents get upset about your friends and, and you think to yourselves, why? I'm not going to do anything. And your parents may say, well, we know you're not, but it's your friend we don't trust <laughs> because we know the companion of fools suffers harm. And your friend is a fool. I'm sorry to tell you, Johnny, or whatever. You know, I, you know. You may not do it, but your friend will. And ultimately, the people around us suffer when we live this way and when we make bad decisions. But you know what else? You hurt the people who care about you. You can't live like this and not hurt the people who care so deeply about you. You teenagers, you can't make decisions without hurting your parents. Parents, you can't make decisions without hurting your spouse or without hurting your kids, your grandkids. I'm just telling you, we aren't islands. We hurt other people. And then you also hurt the people who come along after you. And if we can just get kind of personal for a minute, some of you are dysfunctional. I mean, you put the fun in dysfunction, right? I know. I know. 
You know who you are. You're a little obtuse, you know. <laughs> Maybe you got a little obsessive compulsive personality issues going on, or you're a little difficult to be around, and you look at that, and you're like, you know, where does that come from? And as you get older, you look back, and you look at your childhood, and you look at what you dealt with, and a mom who wasn't there, or a dad who wasn't there, or abandonment, and there wasn't money to pay the rent or to get food on the table, but there was always money for the habit. There was always money for the alcohol or the cigarettes or the scratch-off tickets or fixing the car on cinder blocks or whatever it was. I mean, there was always that... And if you would have asked them at any point in time, they would have said, look, I'm not hurting anybody. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm just, this is my deal. It doesn't have anything to do with my kids. It doesn't have anything to do with my boyfriend or whatever. But that wasn't true, was it? Because someone did get hurt. You got hurt. And you are someone. Our decisions impact generations that come after us. And they hurt people who come after us. I'm telling you, the idea that I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want, and nobody can stop me and it's not going to hurt anyone, it's a myth. It is an absolute myth. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, let me just talk to the Christians in the room right now, Christians watching online. Why would you aspire to that anyway? Why would we aspire to the bottom of the barrel, one, tra- one station away from train wreck? I mean, why would we want that? Why not choose, you know, uh, why not live differently and look up instead of looking down? Why not harnessing our passions and our abilities and our strengths to bless the world? Why not say this, I should be able to do whatever I want, when I want, with whom I want, as long as it helps somebody I mean, why don't we turn it in that direction? Why is it so much about getting away with whatever we can get away with? My friends, I'm telling you, why not aspire to greatness? Wouldn't that be a better place to live? And here's what's kind of interesting about it all, and that's that we're all hypocrites in the end anyway. You know why that is? Because we look at the person who gave us the rule, maybe for you it was your dad, and he said, don't, 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 and you did it anyway, and then you ended up and <laughs> got arrested, and you got a phone call, and you called your dad <laughs> and said, Dad, I'm, I'm in the jail. Can you come pick me up? It's not a field trip. You went to the very person whose rules you ignored, or, or you know, your mom told you, don't date him, don't date him, don't date him, don't move in with him, don't date him, don't date him, but you did anyway, and it worked out for a month or two, and then it went horribly wrong. And who's the first person you call? The one whose rules you ignored in the first place. It's so interesting, isn't it? We're all hypocrites in the end. But do you know the good news here? The good news is that God cares about you. Because that's the story of the nation of Israel. I mean, they went their own way over and over and over again. They went their own way. They did their own thing. They ended up worshiping the Baals. I mean, they even went so far as performing child sacrifices at one point in time. I mean, that's how far Israel went. But when they were ready in humility to surrender to their heavenly father, he sent a judge to redeem them and to bring them back, and to bring wholeness, and to bring hope. And my friends, I'm telling you, we worship a God whose son told us to call him Heavenly Father because he cares about you, and he wants a relationship with you. And when you are ready to cry out for him, he will respond. In fact, the thing I hope you know today and throughout this series is that it's okay to ask God for help. It is okay to ask God for help. And regardless of where you are in that cycle of disobedience, deliverance, and then, or disobedience and disaster and deliverance, wherever you find yourself as we go throughout this series, I hope that in those moments in humility, you can just cry out to God for help. In the midst of your chaos, He's there, and he cares. Ironically, the God you didn't want to call on, the God who said, I don't want you, (laughs) that you said, I don't want you interfering with my life. He's ready and waiting when you are. So as we close today, I want to ask you a question. It's an important question. And that is, if you were God, how would you respond to a culture, 
a nation, or an individual characterized by what I want, when I want, with whom I want. If you were God, how would you respond when you realize that every man unto himself ultimately isolates every man unto himself and from himself, and every woman unto herself does the exact same thing? As you realize that the people that you've created to be in relationship with you, knowing that you want to lead them to a place that is truly life. I mean, Jesus said, I've come that they may have life to the full. What would you do? How would you respond to a nation or maybe more importantly to a people, to a person who's kind of given God the finger and said, I don't care what you want. I don't care what you have to say. I'm going to go it my own way and I'm going to do whatever it is that I want to do. If you were God, how would you respond to that? You know what's interesting? And again, just a couple weeks, we've got a celebration coming up. And our nation, our world, we're going to pause and we're going to celebrate the birth of a king. Again, ironically, kind of like Israel, we're a nation who doesn't want a king. We don't need a king. We don't want a king. We have no king. We are king. And yet we're going to pause and we're going to celebrate the birth of a king who came to teach something vastly different. Isn't that interesting? I hope over the next week you'll think about that. Think about where doing what's right in our own eyes takes us. And then think about the king we celebrate who came to do the very opposite. And I hope you'll be back next week as we continue. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, what a mess of a story! What a mess. And as much as it's easy to point fingers at the Israelites, Lord, uh, we know that for every one of us in this room and watching online, I mean, we all own a piece of that. Maybe not to the same degree, but we all own a piece of doing what we want to do, when we want, with whom we want, and nobody's going to tell us otherwise. Father, we all know what it's like to face that point of disaster, and we all know what it's like to cry out for help. But I pray for the person in the room or watching online who needs help. I pray that every one of us, that we would humble ourselves before you and that we would seek you. God, as we celebrate the birth of a king in just a couple of weeks who came to do something so different than what is modeled in the book of Judges, I pray that we would reflect on his life. Lord, give each one of us wisdom to know what we need to do with what we've heard this morning. And then, Father, give us courage to do it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.